Thank you, Sequoia. So I am delighted to be here to talk about a lot of stuff. So we're going to um, start very small and get really big. We're going to start with really tiny organisms. And then the last thing is, is this idea that those services are the foundation of, of that, those things, uh, the economy and the, and the well-being of humans. And so it's really critical to uh, understand that the health of our ecosystems is really important, especially in the context of, of rapid change from climate change. <clears throat> So first off, just a, a quick definition um, and of what an ecosystem is. Ecosystems are organisms and their physical environment. And they are uh, a, a complex interconnected system. And so from this definition, you can see that scale is really doesn't matter. You can look at any different kind of scale. You can talk about the ecosystem of organisms that live on your skin. That's a very diverse very important ecosystem that is critical to your physical health and um, in some cases your mental health as well. And so you can talk about a very fine scale or you can talk about the global ecosystems, all of the life on the planet and the physical environment that, that really affects that life. And we're going to talk through a couple examples of um, interesting dynamics that happened in forests. And so I want to introduce two words that are kind of fun, I think. One is phylosphere, which uh, just means all of the leafy matter, the above ground part of plants. So sphere just means, you know, the world or um, the, the realm or the place. And phylo is just the word that means leaf. So the world, the ecosystem that lives on leaves, basically. And then rhizosphere is sort of the opposite or the, the bottom end of that. It's the, the same world or realm that happens in the soil uh, beyond our usual ability to see because it's hidden beneath a lot of, of soil. So we're going to start out with the rhizosphere, some of, some of the things that happen in the soil beneath us. This is a really interesting graphic that uh, a form of this was in National Ge Geographic recently to talk about or illustrate the importance of fungi in the soil of forests. And this is really true of all ecosystems. There are fungi that live in the soil and they are, um, you see very small bits of them once in a while when a mushroom pops up above ground or if you eat a truffle that's a, it's basically like a mushroom but it grows underground. And those are the fruiting structures of fungi. And so you can kind of think of them as, as uh, somewhat like the apples on an apple tree. So those mushrooms and the, the truffles are a very small piece of the larger organism. Most of that larger organism is out of sight. It's underground and it's made up of countless numbers of really tiny microscopic threads that penetrate and worm their way all through the soil uh, particle. And those fungal threads do a lot of things. They, they do a lot of decomposition of organic matter, dead organic matter that's on the ground mixed in the soil. They break that down and extract nutrients from it. Um, to live. That's their food source, is that organic matter. Well, it turns out there's a bunch of fungi that get their food from the plants directly. And they do that by hooking up under the ground, under, in the soil, into the roots of the plants. They physically connect to the roots of the plants so that there is a direct exchange of materials. They initiate a, an economy between the plants and the fungi. There's an exchange of materials that goes on. So the plants produce food. As you might remember from high school science, plants photosynthesize. So they take solar energy and turn that energy into food, into carbohydrates, sugars. They use that sugars, those sugars then to build all kinds of, of things. Well, it turns out that, that in a lot of plants, um, as much as 40% or more of that photosynthate, of that food that they produce from sun, goes into the soil and gets excreted by the roots in order to specifically feed a a really diverse community of fungi and bacteria that live in the soil. And they do that in order, not because they're generous of heart, although I'm sure they are at, at the core, <laughs> but they do that uh, to, to form an economy, a, a way of exchanging that food for things that they need. In this case, fungi are really good at getting nutrients and water out of the soil. They're much, much tinier than the smallest plant root. 
This, this is a, an electron micrograph I took of a, a very tiny root that I found in a, in a forest soil um, up in Bellingham. And what you see is actually not the root. So this is a, a, a root that's enveloped by a sheath of fungal threads. So all of those little white threads are, are um, the, the, the threads of a fungus, a single fungus that's completely enwrapped the root. So when you have a, a, a small root, and this is a root that you can, you can just see with your eyes, but it's pretty small, and it's completely enveloped. You, with your eyes, it just looks like a root, a normal root that you would pull out of your garden. But when you look at it with an electron microscope like this at, at uh, about 1,500 times magnification, you see that it's completely enwrapped by fungus. And that fungus has actually penetrated the cells of the plant and it's created this economy. So these tiny threads of fungi, which are far tinier than a root, because of their small size, they can worm their way into all kinds of nooks and crannies in the soil, much smaller than a root can get to. So they can get to a lot more water and a lot more nutrients than the root of the plant can itself. So it sets up this exchange. It absorbs water and nutrients. It gives it to the plant. In exchange, the plant provides carbohydrates to the fungi or food. So it's an exchange of food for minerals and, and water. And so it, it uh, turns out that this relationship is really common among plants. Uh, most uh, between estimates are between 80 and 95 percent of plants have these relationships with fungi in the soil. So they're, they're getting um, this exchange of materials. Well, the fungi, all the fungi threads are kind of illustrated by those uh, tiny white threads in the soil down there. Those fungi are, extend for many, many feet. They can go for hundreds of feet sometimes or even farther than that. The largest organism on the planet is a fungus that's underground and it extends over many, um, I can't remember how many, but it was something like 2,000 acres or something really large size. So it's linking up with a bunch of plants. It's not linked up only to a single tree or a single plant. It's linked up to a bunch of plants in that community. So this, if you think uh, sort of an analogy of um, uh, electrical wires or something like that, for us, this sets up a system where you could envision some kind of communication happening among plants. And it turns out that as we're beginning to study this, that that in fact does happen to a certain extent. So the, the fungi is connected. It's exchanging with all these plants, carbohydrates, water, mineral. There's all this stuff flowing in multiple directions. And one thing that we've figured out is that carbohydrates from adult trees can make their way into young trees in the canopy below it. And if you think about some of our native trees around here, like western red cedar or hemlock, that are shade tolerant, that means that their seeds can germinate in the shade of a dense forest and grow, and the seedlings can survive, and then uh, eventually make their way to the canopy and replace the older canopy trees as they die. There are some tree species that can't do that. For instance, Douglas fir is not shade tolerant, so it can release seeds. If it's a dense forest, the seeds might sprout and grow. The vast majority of those seeds, the seedlings, are going to die. And if the tree canopy remains pretty intact for a long time, they're all going to die because it's just not shade tolerant. So there's just not enough light getting through the canopy for them to grow enough and, and, uh, and uh, take over the canopy. They do really well when there's a disturbance that you know, blows down a bunch of trees, and then suddenly there's a lot of light. If there's dug firs present, they'll take off and grow. But they can't grow very well in the canopy, under the canopy of a, an established forest. The reason is that species like rest and red cedar and hemlocks, the young trees are actually hooked up underground via the fungi to the adult trees. So they're getting a subsidy of food, of carbon, from the canopy trees that are up there photosynthesizing, making food up in the canopy where the sun is, some of that food is getting shipped through the fungi to the young trees. So they're able to hang out, they're able to grow, persist a little bit, and then when an adult tree falls over and there's more light, it can just take off because it's well established and it's healthy. So it, it's a way for a lot of these forests to regenerate and these species specifically to regenerate. 
Another thing that they've found um, that they've just begun exploring is that there is a, a, a way for at least some species to send signals between individual plants, different plants. And there is uh, some really interesting studies been done on the east side of the Cascades with ponderosa pine, for example, that have found this um, on the right there. You can see there's a, um, a caterpillar up in the canopy that's eating the leaves. And there are sometimes fungi or other things that attack the leaves. Well, they found that, that when a tree is attacked in that form, it, pr it produces chemicals to try to fight off that attacker. And those chemicals transport through, just w along with the food and everything, through the fungal network in the soil. And it can trigger other trees in the area to start producing the same defense chemicals before that insect before its population explodes and it starts to spread around to all the surrounding trees or the disease, the fungal disease or something that's attacking the leaves. So it gets the trees in the area, it gets their immune system, if you will, it gets them prepped and ready and starting to produce these defense chemicals that allow them to be better uh, prepared for if that insect is able to take off and really start spreading to other trees in the area. So these fungi create this, this system of exchanging goods, of exchanging information among the plants to which it's attached underground. Really key and important kind of, of process going on there. <clears throat> um, one of the really interesting, uh, I think, um, manifestations of this thing is that once in a while in the forest you can encounter these things called living stumps, which are stump trees that have been cut in the past and the bark has actually continued to grow, it's grown up, it's healed over the top of the cut and it's still alive. So this, this trunk here, this stump here is still alive. The tree was cut but it never died and it's maintained because of it's still connected through the fungi to the trees around it. So it's receiving food, it's able to uh, heal itself, and it's still alive. It's not growing, it's not getting any taller, it's lost all of its, its um, uh, marrow stems that create new shoots. So it doesn't have any leaves and it never will. And it's not, never going to grow any taller. But it's still alive and it's maintained. Uh, why that happens, I have no idea. But it's a wonderful manifestation of this underground connected network that connects different trees with each other and allows those trees to exchange information and, and materials with each other through this underground network. These are called mycorrhizal relationships. So mycorrhizal just means fungi and root. So you've got a fungi and the root of a tree combined underground. And they create this partnership, they create this economy, this exchange of materials and information that's really important. And it's really critical because it does a lot of interesting things. It, it really affects tree growth. So it provides access to a lot more water and nutrients underground. So it affects how much, the gr how fast the tree can grow, how much it grows. Uh, and how big it can get. It's really important in drought resistance because it provides access to resource, water resources that the tree would never be able to get to without that, that partnership. So it's a really important in, in the context of any kind of stress, really. It provides pest resistance, another source of stress to trees and to plants. It, it, it um, um, allows those, those uh, resistance, the communication among the plants to, to help with that. It affects forest productivity. So if you're interested in lumber, for example, and how fast you can regrow a crop, if you don't have the right partnerships in the soil, your growth rates are going to be a lot slower. And so your, your long-term ability to re, re, uh, regrow and recut more timber is going to be affected by what's going on in the soil. It affects forest regeneration. We talked about that, that uh, uh, it, it feeds those young trees and keeps them healthy and prepared to become future canopy trees. It's really important in carbon sequestration in the soil. It turns out that they take a lot of that carbon and they create really stable carbon um, molecules that stay in the soil and that increase the, the carbon content of the soil. So when we talk about climate change and think about ways to mitigate that, this is a really important part of that picture of getting carbon and storing it long term in the soil. And there's a bunch of other things that we'll talk a little bit more as we go through. 
The second story I want to talk about is the yellow spotted millipede. So this is, in our forest, very common. It's, uh, we, we kind of think of it as like the, the Cuisinart of the Northwest forest. That's because it's a shredder. And it's actually a keystone species in our forest systems because of that function that it provides. So it, it takes organic matter, these really large, coarse chunks of organic matter, leaves and uh, so on, conifer leaves, big leaf maple leaves, stems and twigs. It takes this coarse organic matter and it just chews it up, it blends it up into really tiny, tiny pieces. And it turns out that this is really important for a whole number of, of reasons and a whole lot of species. The rate of decomposition of organic matter is, or, or the decomposition happens by, largely by bacteria and fungi that are in the soil. You guys probably know that from composting and everything. That's what decomposes, breaks down this dead organic material and turns it back into uh, um, humus and rich soil, uh, dark soil full of nutrients and water holding capacity and all these other great things for gardens and for forests. So the decomposition happens by those two things. But when you have a dead leaf that is uh, uh, with the cell walls and everything that those, those plants have, it's really hard for bacteria and fungi to get inside the leaf and to really break it down. It takes a long time to do that. But if you take that big leaf and you shred it into 100,000 tiny, tiny pieces, suddenly you've taken the surface area and you've expanded the surface area of that leaf from just that one leaf into 100,000 tiny pieces, the, the surface area is much, much greater. It's hundreds of thousands of times bigger, greater. And that provides the surface area and it breaks up the cell walls that allow the fungi and the bacteria to get in there and start decomposing. So these guys really jumpstart the process of decomposition. If you look from Northern California to Alaska, there are a number of different kinds of shredders. There's three species of this kind of centipede. There's three in Northern California. There's one in Washington. And as they get up towards Alaska, they, um, they drop out really fast in terms of numbers and, and density. In Alaska, I don't think there's actually any of this kind of millipede. There's some other shredders, but they're not as effective. And you can follow that trend where there are lots of these kinds of millipedes the organic matter recycles quickly and the layer of uh, dead leaves on the top of the soil is relatively thin because they get recycled relatively quickly made into rich hummus which gets humus sorry not hummus <laughs> humus the rich decomposed broken down organic matter gets mixed into the soil um, where it becomes available to a lot of other critters and to trees and plants in Alaska, one of the reasons, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons that tree growth rates are lower up there is that a lot of nutrients get locked up in this layer of leaves under the forest because of the uh, low number of shredders that they have there. So the process of getting that material shredded up into tiny bits is much smaller, and you end up with very thick layers of litter accumulating because of that, because of the, the delay that it takes in terms of turning that stuff into uh, humus that gets into the soil. The other thing besides just the organic matter that this does is it creates, by, by shredding this material into extremely tiny pieces, it creates food for a whole bunch of other really tiny organisms. In our area, this, this particular spot of the planet is actually one of the, the hot spot in diversity for soil mites. Most of these guys, except for the big long thing in the middle, are soil mites. And these guys are really tiny. They're so tiny, I mean, you guys may already know this, but your hair follicles, you've got mites in those hair follicles. So they're really tiny. They're related to insects. They're actually more closely related to spiders. Than, uh, than insects, but they're in that same group of, of organisms. And these guys are, they can get up to densities of about 200, 250,000 in a square meter, about this wide of a square. So they're really, really tiny. And when you have lots of yellow spotted millipedes, you have a huge number, both in terms of um, numbers of, or of these guys, the mites, but also diversity. So in that same 
square meter, you can have 50 to 75 different species of soil mites. And these guys eat those really tiny pieces of particles that the centipede creates. So that's why we have such a huge diversity of these critters in our soil. And they take those really tiny particles the centipede creates, and they do the same thing. They, they take them in, they chew them up into little tiny bits, and excrete it. So they make those pellets of, of organic matter smaller and smaller and smaller and more accessible to bacteria and fungi for decomposition. So really key uh, processes going on here. These critters in the soil do a lot of things that are really important and we'll just run through a few of them. One of them is they actually change the physical structure of the soil. They do that because they increase the pore space in a couple of ways. They, all these tiny organisms are burrowing in the soil, and so that burrowing creates tiny, tiny microscopic tunnels through the soil. And as they do their stuff moving through the soil, they're excreting a lot of stuff. They're consuming things and excreting things. Those excretions are sticky, and they hold microscopic soil particles together in aggregates, and that also creates more uh, pore space in the soil. And that, I'll we'll talk about why that's important here in a second. The other thing they do physically is with that organic matter. So they continually to shred that organic matter into tinier and tinier pieces, making it smaller and mixing it down into the soil column. So you start out with the, these leaves on top of the soil. The way that stuff gets into the soil where roots of plants can get at is through this process of insects taking it and moving it down into the soil with them. Second thing they, they do is really regulate nutrient cycling in these soils. And they do that in a couple of ways. One is that decomposition. So they really accelerate the rate of decomposition of that organic matter by breaking it up into tiny pieces. So you've got all these nutrients from the leaves and everything that are on the soil. The way those nutrients get back into the food web and back into the plants is through this process of breaking it down, of shredding it into tiny pieces, making it accessible to the fungi and the bacteria to decompose. And then the second thing is that these burrows and pore spaces that are created allow gas exchange. So they let air mix down into the soil. And air is really important in soil. Roots are alive. All these critters living in the soil are alive. They need oxygen to live. So you've got to get oxygen down into the soil where they can get access to it. And it gets nitrogen down into the soil. So the most common thing in the air that we breathe is nitrogen. It's like 78% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen in the form of N2. No living organism can use that except for bacteria. There are some kinds of bacteria that can take that N2 nitrogen and turn it into forms that the rest of us living organisms can take advantage of. So bacteria, certain kinds of bacteria, cyanobacteria, are the only kinds that can take that nitrogen and fix it or turn it into a form that plants and animals can use. So all the nitrogen in your proteins and your bodies all originates from some bacteria someplace that was able to capture that from the air and turn it into a form that plants could absorb and pass into the food web. So you get nitrogen into the soil where the bacteria are through pore spaces. So that's why these invertebrates are really important for getting that process and accelerating that process and allowing more nitrogen to get into that soil. And then the last thing in terms of nutrients is that they, the nutrient retention. So getting all of that, uh, um, those nutrients captured in the, the soil allows them to, it prevents leaching from hap happening. When a big rainstorm happens and water runs quickly through the soil, it helps to prevent nutrients from getting dissolved in that water and leaching away before the plants can grab them. Third thing that all these critters in soil do that's really important is they regulate water in the soil, water relations, and that gets back to that pore space. When you have lots of pore space, like in the figure on the left there, you get lots of air and lots of water incorporation into the soil. It allows the water to infiltrate in the soil. If you have really heavy clay soils in your garden, you know that in the summer you water and that water starts running off almost immediately. And part of the reason is that there's not much in terms of pore space in the soil that allows that water to infiltrate to where the roots can actually get to it. 
So these critters are really important for getting water into the soil and for holding that water, for increasing that organic matter and holding that water in the root zone where the roots can really get to it. And that's um, really an important function that these tiny critters do in the uh, soil. Another thing they do is, is disease suppression. So there's a lot of invertebrates in the soil that actually are predators of pathogens. And it's a really important function that they provide as they're wandering through the soil. The fifth thing they do, another thing, is, is this mycorrhizal stimulation. So there's some things like this, this springtail here that feeds on the fungi in the soil. And so it will nibble the ends of all those mycorrhizal um, strands that we talked about that are in the soil. And it's sort of like uh, pruning a shrub. You nip off the growing ends and it causes lots of branching and increased growth. So it actually stimulates the expansion of these mycorrhizal networks in the soil by having these critters in there moving around and feeding and, and, um, and uh, moving the fungi around as well. These critters, you can see they're, they're kind of hairy. They get fungal spores mixed into the, their hairs and then they crawl through the soil and spread the spores of that fungi around through their soil. So they're really important to moving those mycorrhizal fungi around which are so critical for, for plants. And then these critters are really important for carbon sequestration again, for getting that carbon in the soil into a form that will be uh, stored for the long term in that soil. So they're really important in that process as well. So there's a lot of things that these tiny um, uh, critters in the soil do that we you know, really know nothing about. Most of us know nothing about them, let alone even see them or know that it's happening below the ground. So just in summary, for the, these critters in the soil, they increase nutrient availability, they increase soil water infiltration and holding, they reduce stormwater runoff because they're allowing more of that water in a rainstorm to infiltrate the soil and to be held by it. So they're really important in managing stormwater runoff. They reduce flooding for the same reason and erosion for the same reason. They let a larger, a much larger proportion of the rain in a rainstorm get into the soil and infiltrate into the, the aquifer. And then they have this role in expanding the mycorrhizal networks, which are so critical for plants. And that's a few of their, their benefits. <clears throat> So that's just uh, two kind of small pictures of, of some of the, a few of the dynamics happening in soil. Now we're going to jump to the leaves, the phylosphere, and talk a little bit about a couple things that happen up there that are really interesting and invisible to us, but important. In our forests, all plants, you know, usually have herbivores of some kind, things that eat them. And in most cases, uh, that's not a great thing for the plant in terms of its, its own fitness and ability to grow. And so they develop defense mechanisms against those kinds of attacks, just like our body develops defense mechanisms and Im immune reactions to uh, bad bugs that get inside of us, bad um, bacteria and pathogens that attack us. Well, the same thing happens with leaves. But if you think of a, uh, something like a tree which lives for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, insects have a very rapid life cycle, so they can adapt to the chemicals that a tree can produce very quickly. So a tree might produce a chemical that makes it distasteful to an insect that's eating it or that poisons the insect that's eating it as a defense mechanism. But the insect has a very rapid life cycle, and so it can adapt to that. It can de develop de its own defenses against the defenses of the tree. So how does a long-lived tree or a plant keep up with this, this sort of um, uh, armed warfare with the things that are trying to eat it. Well, it turns out that one of the ways that it can do that is, again, through fungi. So there are, in the leaves, you may not know this, but plants, almost all plants that we've looked at so far have fungi not just connected to the roots, but actually throughout the body of the plant. So there are fungi, tiny fungi, that live inside the leaves of plants, of trees, and inside the stems, and they all have many different functions. In the case of some of these conifer trees, there are fungi that are inside the leaves. The tree feeds them. So just like the fungi in the soil, they're getting carbon, they're getting food from the tree. 
in exchange for defense. When this leaf gets nibbled on by an insect, it triggers the fungi. They suddenly become very active. They go from the sort of dormant phase, just hanging out, eating, drinking at the expense of the tree and having a good old time. But then when they get attacked, when that leaf gets attacked, they go into and start doing their job, which is to create chemicals to prevent that leaf from being eaten by the insect. Fungi have a very rapid life cycle. So they allow the tree to keep up with the chemical warfare that the insects are doing and that uh, fungal pathogens are doing. All these things that are trying to attack and eat uh, a tree, for example. The, these beneficial fungi that live inside the leaves are able to help them keep up with that chemical warfare, to adapt, to produce a new chemical that is more distasteful for, to the insect or that uh, does some other thing that, that limits the damage from these kinds of, of insects. So the fungi lives in the leaves. Another example of partnerships in the canopy is bacteria, again. And if you look at the leaf of any plant, it is completely covered with a microbiome of hundreds of species of bacteria and fungi. And this is you know, this is something that is relatively new, I think, to even scientists, to their understanding, which is amazing because we've been looking, studying our human bodies for a long time for medis medical reasons, and we know all about our microbiome. We know about it in the gut and how important it is to digestion and to our health. We know that we have a microbiome on our skin and in our hair, and everywhere we're covered with other critters. Our body has more living cells that are non-human in it and on it than it has human living cells. So we're a, a diverse and a productive ecosystem and that ecosystem is really key for our health. So surprise, surprise, same thing happens with other organisms besides humans. Forests, trees, plants have a microbiome on their surface and that microbiome is really important to a lot of different things that the tree does. They do things like protect the tree from bad bacteria and bad fungi. So there's always you know, good actors and bad actors, and there's fungi and bacteria that want to attack the tree and to consume it or that are pathogenic in some way. And there's uh, bacteria and fungi that are beneficial. And those beneficial ones help to outcompete the bad guys. They, uh, some of them produce path, um, chemicals that actually kill the bacteria or the fungi that are bad, so they produce antifungal and antibacterial agents that act on just the bad stuff. They produce, um, actually I think I have a slide listing some of these things. So those bacteria on the trees um, do a lot of different things. They capture nu nutrients and exchange those with the plant. So a lot of dust and, and particles fall on the leaf of the plant. Well, bacteria are able to, capture, able to capture a lot of those nutrients and actually give them to the plant in exchange for food. So just like the fungi in the soil, there's an exchange of nutrients and water going on across the leaf surface. It's really important. Some of those bacteria are nitrogen fixers, so they're able to take that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and pass it on. Some of them protect against pathogens, as I was just talking about. They, they, they produce chemicals that kill the bad guys, or they outcompete the bad guys in some fashion. They do things like stimulate plant hormones, so they actually stimulate the growth of the leaf. They produce and stimulate hormones that make the leaf grow faster, that make it produce more chloroplasts so that it photosynthesizes more, it captures more energy, and it grows a larger and a thicker leaf as a result of this community living on it. It, it, it encourages those leaves to grow and to be able to capture more light because they, they have more nutrients and water access. Those bacteria on the tree leaves have been shown to be really positively correlated with a, a number of different things. That, that leaf size and the mass of the leaf, its ability to photosynthesize as a result of those added nutrients and protection from stresses. It affects tree fitness, so how healthy it is and how long those trees live is affected by the, that community of bacteria that grows on the leaves. The growth rate and the longevity of that, those trees are affected by it. And things like wood density are affected by the bacteria that lives on the surface of the leaves. So there's a lot of dynamics going on there that has significant impacts for the, the trees themselves and uh, obviously for the bacteria, because the bacteria are getting a lot of food and materials in exchange for that. 
I just wanted to make one plug for the citizen science project that's starting here on Fidalgo looking at the forest system. And that's that a lot of this knowledge that we have about leaf bacteria comes from a very long-term study and it's only possible because of a very long-term data set from a specific place that was set up by the Smithsonian Institute in Panama. When the canal, Panama Canal was built, there's this island in the middle of it that uh, became a research reserve and there's, there's detailed every single tree in this 124 acre plot uh, is known. It's, you know, when it started to live, how fast it grew, what its neighbors were. It, all the details of the life history of every individual tree is known. And because of that, they're able to look at the bacteria on these trees and, and link those bacteria communities with the outcomes that happened for the, the tree. So this knowledge, which is just barely getting us into this whole realm of understanding bacteria on tree leaves, that, that knowledge only came about from that long-term data set. <clears throat> okay, so why do all these partnerships matter in a forest? They're partnerships with individual organisms, but those partnerships add up to a lot of things. So they, they affect individual organisms like their growth rate, they affect the, the total biomass that gets produced in the food web. So if you're, you're pumping these nutrients in this water and encouraging this growth, you get a lot more biomass that gets pumped into the whole food web of the, the system. It produces oxygen, so we all breathe oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that gets produced is related to how, much, how many trees there are, how fast they're growing, uh, and uh, things like tree longevity. There's, there's a lot of things like resilience to stress. So the resilience to drought stress, for example, the resilience to pathogens and to other kinds of attacks is, is related to these important relationships that occur with these, these um, um, hidden tiny organisms that we know little about. So especially in the context of climate change, when we think about the additional stresses, the climate change is sort of tweaking all these dials on ecosystems, ramping up the stress on each one just a little bit. That's really important. And in that context, these kinds of relationships are going to be absolutely critical to whether or not an ecosystem can adapt and be resilient in that kind of a changing environment. So there's a whole list of stuff that, that is really important as an outcome of these hidden partnerships. Um, and so it's, it's really important to the ecosystem and it's also really important to humans. So this, this, um, this talk is really three college classes boiled down into one hour. And so we just did ecology. Now we're going to start shifting into uh, economics. <clears throat> I didn't want to feature economics too prominently in the title because then I thought that nobody would show up. Um, so I had to make it sound like <clears throat> something much more interesting, like millipedes are much more interesting, right? Uh, so this is where we start transitioning to that broader perspective. And, and part of that transition is, is understanding this idea of emergent properties in ecosystems. So emergent properties are something that's a characteristic of a complex system that is not a characteristic of any of the individual parts. So it emerges from that broader system. It's a product of that whole complex system working together. And the best example I know of is our brain. So our brain is made up of a gazillion neurons and a bunch of things called glial cells. I don't know what those do. And a bunch of blood vessels. And that's, that's about it. And yet there's this thing that we know of as consciousness. We're all conscious organisms. We know uh, that we're alive and we know who we are as individuals. And that comes out of, it's an emergent property of all of those individual little bits of the brain. So not any one of those cells, not even any group of those cells creates consciousness. It's something, it's a property, it's a characteristic of a really complex system. All those interacting complex parts working together to produce an emergent property or to produce consciousness. So it's, it's a product of that larger system. It's not a product of any individual part of that system. So a lot of what we've been talking about then is that the, a lot of things we think of as, as related to individual pieces of a forest ecosystem are not the result of 
the tree, for example. The tree that we see, that tree that we see the, is not the result of just that tree's efforts. It's the result of a large, complex, hidden system that produces a lot of, of uh, things that ultimately results in that tree. So that long list that we showed earlier, just a second ago, those are essentially emergent properties. Those are things that are produced by a whole bunch of interacting characteristics that work together and that result in a tree that result in the, the how fast that tree grows, how, how long it lives, that results in how much it's able to produce oxygen, how, how resistant it is to being attacked by different organisms. And when you look at a forest stand, uh, you know, if you're interested in lumber production, for example, and all you're interested in is how much lumber you can extract over uh, an, a, a big amount of time. That amount of lumber that you can produce and extract is an emergent property of all these other things going on in that ecosystem, that forest ecosystem. That simple thing, how much lumber can I extract over the next 500 years, is a product of a whole bunch of stuff happening in that, that ecosystem. So these things that forests and other ecosystems do, we're just using forests as an example, these things are, are things that humans really need from these ecosystems. And these, these are the emergent properties that this complex ecosystem generates and creates for us. So that's what we're kind of going to um, start talking about is why healthy ecosystems underpin our well-being and our economy at the global scale. So biodiversity is cool. We all care about it. We love it. But so what? Um, human well-being and the global economy depend entirely on healthy ecosystems. And what we've really been seeing a lot over the past recent decades is that ecosystems are degrading and declining for many different reasons. And as that happens, it's causing more and greater economic impacts at a global scale. And now we have climate change, which is really opening everybody's eyes that, wow, something big is happening. And yes, it's going to have really big economic impacts on us as a species. Climate is one of those things that is a, um, in part controlled by these, these uh, and affected by these complex ecosystems. So human well-being and the global economy really key. This brings us to the, the topic of ecosystem services. So what is the link then between a healthy habitat, a healthy ecosystem, and humans? It's the things that these ecosystems provide to us. So they provide a whole bunch of stuff to us as a species that's really key. And we call those things ecosystem services or nature's benefits for humans. So they provide two really big things. First is they provide raw materials. So they provide um, the goods and the energy that, that are all inputs to our economy. So our economy is based on the conversion of things that we harvest out of ecosystems, raw materials, whether it's uh, lumber or extraction of fossil fuel from the ground or uh, mining of minerals out of the ground or fish in the sea, all of the, the things that drive our economy, the manufacturing of computers. If you're a travel agent, you do your work on computers and you rely on wire and power and uh, other forms of, of communication, all that material is built from things extracted from ecosystems or that, uh, ha that result in the conversion of, of ecosystems in order to get them out of the ground. So raw materials and energy or goods that ecosystems provide. And then the second thing is free services that those ecosystems provide for us that are critical to the economy. And we'll talk through examples of these things. So uh, scientists in studying these things have come up with four categories of the services that habitats provide. <clears throat> the first one is provisioning services or goods. Those are the, the, the things that we harvest or mine or remove from ecosystems in some fashion. It's the food, it's uh, fresh water, wood and fiber, it's fuel that we extract from the ground, whether it's fossil fuel or from uh, hydropower or solar power. It's things that are extracted from ecosystems in some fashion or another. <clears throat> so these are the goods that uh, ecosystems provide. The second kind of thing that ecosystems provide are cultural resources or cultural services. So these are things like places to recreate to uh, the trails in uh, and of course forest lands are examples 
a spiritual connection for a lot of people. Technical inspiration. Um, there's this great thing that hopefully will replace styrofoam soon that's made from fungal mycelia. The same thing that we just talked about in forest soils. You can get that to form and uh, be made into things that are just like styrofoam and they biodegrade uh, and you get rid of the, the multiple sins that, that uh, styrofoam create on the planet. Uh, another technical inspiration example in our area is there's this, a native fish called the clingfish, which has this, this sucker on the base of its head that allows it to live in intertidal zones and it is able to stick with the sucker to slimy things like slimy rocks, algae covered rocks, and also really rough things in the intertidal zone. So if you're in a really uh, intertidal zone where there's waves crashing, there's a lot of really powerful hydrodynamics going on, pushing things around, it allows them to stick in place and not be tumbled about by this, all this activity. Those suckers turn out to be a great example of something that solves a lot of problems for us. For instance, when you have surgery and they use clamps to pull organs apart so they can get down deep inside your gut to some hidden thing down there, those clamps cause physical damage that, are, that result in a lot of complications often because they damage the, the sensitive slimy tissues in your body. Well, if you have a suction thing that you can turn off and on, like the clinkfish is able to do, you can attach it to a, a, a slimy piece of tissue in your gut, pull it apart, pull it out of the way so you can get to something else, and it doesn't create damage to the, the body. So it's a, a, a local example of this kind of technical in inspiration idea. Educational services and, and many other types of cultural services. The third type of service is what we call regulating services. So this is the way that ecosystems regulate really important processes for us as, as humans. Climate regulation is a great one. So forests are really important to absorbing carbon. They're really uh, important to the, the, what happens to water. So they get water, they allow it to infiltrate into the soil and they pick up that water and they photosynthesize and they expire that water back into the atmosphere. And it, they found that, that the climate in areas that are a couple thousand miles away from where we are right now is affected by the photosynthesis and that expiration of water that our forests do. We have such expansive and large forests here that, that move a lot of water from the soil into the air. That actually affects climate on, in the central area in the east coast. In, in many ways. Um, so it's, it's a big role that, that different kinds of ecosystems do. Flood attenuation, show an example in a little bit. But forests and other kinds of ecosystems are sponges. They just absorb a whole bunch of water, let it infiltrate to the soil, and let that water move slowly through the soil into the uh, groundwater, eventually into the river, and then out of the river. When you cut down a tree and you create a, a, a large clear cut of an area, you remove that sponge effect and you create a, a much bigger increase in the amount of water that just runs off, gets into the river right away and creates floods. And we'll give an example in a sec. Um, <clears throat> pest regulation is another great example. Bats pr kill a whole bunch of insects. There was a, an interesting paper that found that bats around the globe are worth uh, more than a billion dollars just to corn farmers b because of their ability to prey on a single organism, the um, corn weevil, e corn ear weevil, or, or some kind of moth that, whose larvae attacks corn. So, you know, bats eat all kinds of stuff and they have all kinds of economic impacts, but just one of those, just one of those affects corn farmers to the tune of one billion dollars in terms of how much they lose or not of their crop to the, the insect and how much they have to spend in terms of pesticides and herbicides and, or, or pesticides to, to kill that, those things that eat the corn. So it's a billion dollar worth of just one thing that the bats eat. So think of all the other stuff that bats do. It's really important and it's a free service. Water purification. So there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that, that ecosystems do in terms of regulating processes that are really important to our well-being and to our economy. And then the last category of services are services that are kind of indirect. In other words, they don't generate a direct benefit to us. But without them, we would not get those other three kinds of services at all. So a great example is nutrient cycling. Bacteria 
take the nitrogen out of the air, turn it into nitrogen in the soil, and as a result of that, we get great uh, agricultural food crops, we get um, forests that grow, and lots of other ecosystems that are grow and are productive because of that bacterial nutrient cycling that's really important. Process of soil formation happens over thousands and thousands of years, and the reason that the Skagit Delta is such a rich place for growing plants is because of those long processes of the movement and the grinding down of rocks and the deposition and creation of this wonderful flat land for growing good crops. So supporting services is the, the last category of things that ecosystems do that really support our well-being. <coughs> I'll step through these next slides pretty fast because this is just sort of provides a little bit greater detail. Um, so we don't need to spend too much time on this. But this is that first kind, the goods. So this is the harvest. This is really looking at the removal of mostly tangible things from ecosystems that are the raw materials and the energy that drive our economy. So the things that we manufacture, um, the things that we build, the things that we create, comes from raw materials that are extracted in some form at some point from ecosystems around the, the planet. That second one of regulation services. Um, so examples are attenuation of disturbance. So we mentioned flooding. Also forest fire is another great one. Forests on the east side of the Cascades have a great natural way of preventing catastrophic fires. They have frequent low intensity fires that keep the level of fuel down low. And for many, many thousands of years, they did a great job of that. And then we came along and decided we didn't like fire and we stopped all of those fires from happening. And as a result, we got really dense forests and a lot of buildup of fuel. And now when there's a fire, it's catastrophic. It kills everything, all the trees. It kills the, the structure of the forest itself. Big impacts, obviously, economically, if you're growing trees, but big impacts economically on health and on personal uh, health. And that's something that ecosystems did great before we kind of fiddled and twiddled with it and um, disturbed it in a fashion that, that made those fires become catastrophic. Um, <clears throat> water flow, pollination, another kind of a regulation service, climate regulation we talked about. Uh, so we talked about different examples. And we'll just move through these slides fairly rapidly. The th uh, third kind was those cultural services, so benefits from, from kind of non-material services that ecosystems provide. Things like ideas and, and experience, cultural heritage, whether in this area, uh, you know, there's a lot of tribal cultural heritage, there's a lot of cultural heritage around fishing and around salmon, the iconic species for the Northwest, a lot of cultural heritage around agriculture in this particular county. So really important things and based on things that ecosystems provide. Aesthetics, appreciation of beauty, recreation, um, inspiration, health, mental and physical. That's one of the really important services I think the Anacortes Forest Lands provide to us as a community is physical health and mental health from having the, that resource there and available. Um, it's part of our sense of place here, part of our, our well-being. Education, so there's been a number of studies that have found things like if you have a window in a classroom with trees outside, students learn better. If they can just see something alive. To me, that's, that's pretty amazing. Another service, of course, is you know, in our forest lands is things like Friends of the Forest have, do a lot of educational programs, and so they get kids and adults and other people out into the forest lands, and that's a, a possible because we have those forest lands right, right next to us. Science and technology, so inspiration for different things. Um, oh, lower right there, there's that microfoam that's, that they're trying to develop into a product to replace styrofoam. They're doing a great job with it, it actually works. It's still more expensive than styrofoam, of course, and, and uh, so nobody's using it. Uh, well, that's not true. Some people are using it, but um, most people won't <laughs> until it, it is able to economically compete. The reason it can't compete is because there's a lot of costs in styrofoam that aren't incorporated into the price of that product, the waste products of that. Um, supporting services. 
those are the indirect services without which we wouldn't have any of the, the other services. So soil formation, things like that. Photosynthesis, habitat. So for example, we have a, a uh, um, I can't remember the number, I think it was like $4 billion or something global wild salmon fishery. It's worth billions of dollars to the global economy. It's a really big in the Northwest, of course. That is possible because we have habitat for them. So riparian forest habitat doesn't directly impact us in terms of, of you know, the, that habitat it provides to salmon. It's helping the salmon, it's not helping us directly. But we wouldn't get that salmon to harvest without really healthy riparian forest habitat to provide the, the food and the bugs that the salmon need. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about four different kinds of, of services. One of those is goods, and so we're going to kind of contrast because that first one, provisioning services, the goods, are a little bit different from the other types of ecosystem services that are, pro are provided, and this turns out to be fairly important. First thing is that goods, those are the things that are mostly tangible, so they're things you can touch, the things you can harvest and remove from an ecosystem like trees, fish, oil, soil, uh, things like that. Services tend to be mostly intangible, so like flood protection offered by a, an intact forest ecosystem. It's not something you can necessarily touch, but it has a huge impact on you as an individual. A second difference there is the goods result from the harvest of the physical structure of those ecosystems. So we get goods out of ecosystems by harvesting them. We get lumber by taking the trees out of forests. We, take, we get uh, fish to eat by taking the fish, the major structure in the, in the ocean, out of the, the ocean. So we harvest the physical things out of the ecosystem. Services are provided by those same physical things in that ecosystem. So for example, trees, one service they provide is lumber. We harvest them, take them out of the ecosystem. That's the good. They also are really important in terms of sponges and capturing that water and getting it infiltrated into the soil and preventing floods. And so that service uh, that a forest provides of absorbing that water, preventing floods, is regulated by those trees. And so that sets up this really interesting um, trade-off, this dynamic that happens. We need these things that we take out of ecosystems and when we take them out, it reduces the services that that ecosystem can now provide, the other kinds of services that it can provide. So we need the lumber, we take it out. When we take it out too fast or too much, that impacts the other services that that forest ecosystem would otherwise be able to provide. So we take out too much lumber from a, a large forest stand and res we re uh, result in floods, erosion, and um, things like that. So there's this trade-off. We need them both, but there's this trade-off between them. Goods often provide an individual benefit. So you can own the goods, and that's what really our, our economy is based on, that some people own certain things, other people own other things. And so I can own a forest, and I can take the trees out of there and sell it. As a, as a thing, because it's something that I physically own. So there's an individual benefit to, ha to physically owning or controlling the, the resource in this case. Services in large part are something that is a, is a benefit that's provided to a larger community. So I can own a 100,000 acre forest and have the, the rights to harvest that and sell it and make money off of it. So that's a service of goods that the ecosystem provides. And the hydrological benefits that forest provides affects everything downstream. So it's not constrained to the land that I own. The community that lives downstream is affected by what happens on my land, those other services. So when I cut, if I decide to cut 100,000 acres of forest all at once, luckily I can't do that anymore, but uh, in the good old days, right, you could do that. If I could do that, the community downstream is going to be hosed because they're going to be a really increased threat of, of a flood, of erosion, of landslides, of all that kind of stuff happening. So those services are often things that are provided to the broader uh, community. So we need, again, we need both of those things happening. Goods, as I mentioned, can be privately owned because of the, they're a physical, tangible thing that you can hold and grab. 
and services tend to not be privately owned. There's, there's, um, for all of these, there's, of course, exceptions to this. So those services like flood protection, for example, is, is something that, that is, isn't owned by any individual. But it's, a, it's a characteristic for a community. Their level of risk or exposure to floods is created by their entire surrounding ecosystem, which is owned by a whole bunch of people. And then lastly, there's because of these tangible things, there's clear price signals. So I have a price for lumber that tells me how much those trees on my land is worth. There's an economy that tells me how much my stuff is, is worth. With services, those often lack good price signals. So flood control is one great example of that. What's, what's the value, if I own 100,000 acres of forest, what's the value that that provides in terms of flood control to the community? I, there isn't a clear price on that. And as a result, many of our decisions we make as a society is based on those price signals. And if there's no price signal, the economic assumption is that it's worth zero. And that's where uh, you run into lots of problems. And that's where the, the role of regulation comes in, is to try to fill those gaps and to say, yes, uh, there's no price on the flood control, but that has significant and important impacts on a society. And so we're going to regulate how big of a clear cut you can do at any one time in any particular area. So there's, there's ways of, of dealing with that. So these differences are, are important, as we'll talk about. This is just an example of what happens, this trade-off between goods and services. The Chehalis flood in 2007, which you may remember, closed down I-5 for a number of days, and it had huge economic impacts way beyond just the, even the watershed. And a lot of those impacts were the result of large-scale harvest of forests in the watershed that happened in, in the uh, couple of decades prior to that big event. So we had this huge storm and a huge proportion of the sponge that used to be there to soak up all that water, let it infiltrate slowly and get into the river slowly. A lot of that sponge was gone. And as a result, we saw huge runoff. We saw 732 landslides in this watershed. 75% of them were directly related to logging in the past couple of decades, either like you see on the wire hairs there, clear cut there on the site itself or on logging roads that were not properly designed or, or constructed and triggered erosion events, landslides. You can see the river along the base of that slope capturing all that sediment coming in. Um, <clears throat> $57 million in direct flooding damages to homes, farms, businesses, and drinking water utilities from all of this sediment that got in there and from the water not being absorbed and really slowly, all of that water coming down out of the watershed. And over $900 million in total economic costs to, to people from uh, loss of work, from loss of ability to get goods up and down the freeway, from all these other impacts from uh, the cost of recovering. And a lot of this impact, not, not all of it, but a large proportion of it became, came because of this trade-off that we had between goods and services. We extracted a whole bunch of goods, trees from the forest, and we lost the other services that those same trees provide. We went way too far in one end of the, the extraction of resources and services. <clears throat> So how does this roll up then to economies? The, uh, one of the ideas in this talk that I want to convey is this idea that the global economy is not separate from the ecosystem, from the global ecosystem. In fact, it's a, a subsystem of it. It's a part of it. It's within the larger global ecosystem. So we have in the larger global ecosystem, an energy source from the sun comes in and it creates all these ecosystems, photosynthesis and all kinds of stuff that, that really get the whole system going. And then there's heat loss at the other end. So we all um, go through, metabolize and give off heat and, and everything that happens in terms of of growth and work gives off heat in some fashion. Within that system, we've got the economy and we have human well-being. And human well-being is affected by both of those things. So ecosystems generate these ecosystem services we've been talking about that are really critical for human well-being. Everything from the oxygen that we breathe to the food, to the health of the air and the water that we consume, all these things that directly impact humans. And then, of course, there's economic services that are also critical to human well-being. So we have an economy that allows us to earn money, to purchase things that we um, need, that we can't make ourselves or do ourselves, and create this exchange among 
people. And so both of these are really important, ecosystem services and economic services. The economy is based on the extraction of all of this, these raw materials and energy from ecosystems that come into the economy and energy, and then we manufacture all kinds of things with those things, and we do all kinds of service-related things in the economy. But it all starts with the extraction of raw materials from ecosystems to fuel that manufacturing process. So that drives the economy. And then all of that is, becomes waste at some point. So matter and energy are conserved in some fashion. When, we're done, when our economy is done with it, they go back into the ecosystem. So the ecosystem also plays a role in taking all that waste and recycling it and turning it back into something that we can reuse. So the economy exists as a subsystem or a part of that global ecosystem. And it's completely dependent on the products and the services provided by that global ecosystem. <clears throat> this is where we start to get into the weeds of economics. So if you remember your economics class, I don't. <laughs> I had to brush up on this. Um, there are some different kinds of capital that drive the economy, that make it function, make it work, and make it produce all kinds of important things that we as humans Need. There's five kinds of, of capital required for that um, to generate that human prosperity and, and well-being that we're, that we're after. And we've talked about ecosystems. So we've got this global ecosystem. It produces all these goods and services that are really important and provides uh, for the human well-being from some of those services. And then the goods that it produces fuel the economy. So those goods are the natural capital. That's the first type of capital that economists talk about as really important in an economy. They're the source of the raw materials and the energy that drive the economy. And then there's human capital. So we bring in labor and ability and uh, skills to take that raw material, manufacture things with it, and do important things in the economy with it. And uh, we manufacture buildings, equipment, machines that let us do more things and all kinds of other complex things in the economy. And you come up with an innovative idea and you can do it if you can turn those raw materials and energy into uh, tools. And so we manufacture things and that's another type of capital, manufactured capital that we create based on the raw materials. So we make things that help us do more and more and more complex things and bigger things within our economy. We manufacture things and we create manufactured capital. As part of that economy, as it's churning, you, we create financial capital. So we create this resource of finances which then can fuel further investment in the economy, further innovation, further diversification in the economy, and drive that uh, expansion of, of businesses. And then we have the last type of capital, which is social capital. And social capital is the kinds of things that um, really kind of ramp up our ability to do all of these economic things. They're based on relationships among people and what those relationships do. So for example, the education level of a local community defines a lot of the manufacturing and the services that that economy in the local place can, can do. So we have a marine technical center here. That's a, um, an investment in a creating a particular kind of knowledge and skill level in our workforce that allows them to do particular things in the economy. So it's part of the, the social capital that develops the, the human resource to, uh, to drive the economy forward. Social capital also includes relationships among people. So we have natural groupings of people who are similar to each other, and we have groups of people who are very different from each other. And social capital is that relationship between within the groups that builds uh, relationships and, and, and creates trust and the ability to do economic things, knowing that you're going to get paid at the end of the week or that you're going to um, get some other thing in exchange for it. And it also bridges those different diverse groups. It creates relationships that allow the economy to work across diverse groups of, of people. So there's five kinds of capital that all are important to the global economy. And as you can see, the global ecosystem is really critical because it has a huge impact on natural capital. It's the source of all of our natural capital and energy. 
and it has a huge impact on the human and the social capital in terms of the, the services that it provides to us. <clears throat> okay, so all of this is just trying to convey this idea that ecosystems are really engines of productivity for us at the, at the global scale. These ecosystems supply the goods and services. So they're, they're, you can think of ecosystems as, as engines. So they're doing work for us and generating good things for us, goods and services that, that they provide for us that drive our economy and our well-being. How fast that engine runs, how fast those ecosystems are able to support us really depends on if any parts are missing from the engine. So if you lose parts to the engine, it starts to not be quite as efficient or as effective or productive in terms of working and generating stuff. And ecosystems are that way. You lose parts, you start to lose species and diversity, and those ecosystems become less productive and less able to produce those things that are really key for us. And then how much fuel there is, that also affects how fast that engine is able to work. So if you are low on gas, that engine's not going to do a lot of work. And that idea of fuel in ecosystems is really the abundance of life. How many different types of organisms you have. Um, so a, a forest that has very few trees is not going to generate very much lumber because there just isn't enough fuel in that ecosystem to really make it churn out the products and the services that we need. So healthy ecosystems are able, they're, they're like engines that have all their parts and that are running at full speed and they're producing lots of goods and lots of services. So we can harvest all the lumber we need from a forest that's healthy. And if it's harvested in a right way that doesn't cause the loss of species diversity and that promotes all those interconnections, those hidden ecological connections that we talked about earlier, if we preserve those kinds of things and make um, all those different parts that make the, the ecosystem work, then that ecosystem will produce a lot more and a lot faster the products that we need and the services. So we can harvest things like lumber and we can still ret retain the services like flood control that that forest also provides if we maintain all the parts and if we manage it in a way that, that doesn't dis um, take out the, those goods too quickly. <clears throat> So one analogy I like to think about it is this, is the investing analogy, that, that idea that you, if you can create enough of a, a, a core capital investment, so you have enough money uh, socked away and it's invested in a diverse number of things, then you can live off of the interest of that. And so um, if you have that, that built up, then you just take off the interest. If you are wanting to live in a luxurious life that extends beyond the, uh, the amount of that interest that you get every year off that money, then you start to take money out of the capital and you start to reduce that. And that reduces the amount of interest that you get next year. So you can go for a number of years maybe, uh, live in the high life, but eventually the capital is exhausted and you have nothing left. And that's really what ecosystems are about. And that's, uh, I think, what we're hoping to get towards and what we need to get towards is an economy that is restorative in the sense that it restores this engine of productivity that we have that allows us to produce at a high rate the things we need uh, without losing the, its ability to function. So the analogy is that you invest in your natural capital. You invest in the restoration of those ecosystems um, and those ecosystems then become more and more productive of the goods and the services that we need and then you live off the interest. So that ecosystem engine is running at full speed and you get all of those products and services that you need from those, those healthy ecosystems. When we drain the health of these ecosystems, we lose diversity, we harvest them too quickly, then we really lose the long-term productivity of that ecosystem with, with uh, large economic impacts in the future. And that um, really comes into stark relief when we think about climate change impacts. Uh, so that's it. 
Ecosystems are amazingly complex. There's all kinds of really interesting things that go on in them that are invisible to most of us. A lot of these things we still have no idea about. The whole thing with bacteria and the canopy is something that we just are beginning to, to get to know some of the details. Of. We have no idea how it all works. We just know it's important. So they're really complex and they're really important. That complexity is what generates crucial services for us. That, that's that's the, the complexity that gives us the um, quality of life that we have and it's the complexity that gives us the, the things we need to drive our economy. Those services are the foundation of that economy and our well-being. When ecosystems are, are uh, healthy, they produce and they support the economy and they support human well-being to a, a tremendous degree. When we allow those ecosystems to degrade over time, that also degrades all those other things that we depend on from those ecosystems. So we really need to invest in those ecosystems for the long term. And my hope in, with climate change, which is a, can be a really source of a lot of depression and, and, and morbid thoughts, but one of my hopes is that it will uh, provide the stimulus and the, the sort of the wake up call that ecosystems are really critical. And in the context of adapting to climate change, we can take this opportunity to really revise the way that our economy works and focus on this idea of restoring the engine of productivity that we depend on for so much stuff. And I think that's it. Thank you.